Hey everyone, uh, it's me, uh, Austin Belzer from Austin B Media. I am here today with the director of Mr. Soul, which has its premiere on HBO Max, well, as of this recording, tomorrow. Um, it's a film about uh, Ellis Hayslip. Uh, he put on this wonderful, um, doc uh, not documentary, uh, series on PBS, actually NET at the time, if I'm correct. Um, about, well, in short, I guess the term today would be black excellence. Um, and super great documentary. It came out a few years ago, so you might have seen it. Um, but yeah, um, everyone check it out. I'll have a review up as this is going up. So check both of them out. Um, so welcome, Melissa Hayslip. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here with you. Thanks yeah, for having me. Uh, me too. Uh, I, I love these kinds of interviews um, where um, you just, I, I just love interviews in general because I feel like a the general audience, um, you know, they go watch a movie and they don't really get the story um, right. behind all of it. Um, Oh, it's so great to have like an insight into all the elements that happen in a film and the intentionality around it and the team. It's so rare. Some people just want to go and have the film experience, but other people really yeah. want to dive in. And especially this film, Mr. Soul, it's so rich and it's it has literally three storylines happening at the same time. So it's a lot to take in. And you'd be surprised, Austin. Um, many people have said to me, either I had to stop the film because I couldn't believe what I was seeing <laughs> and go back, or I had to watch it two or three times to really take it in fully. And that really makes me happy that it can capture many different kinds of people, their, their imagination and inspire them to learn more. That's what you want, you know, you want to start a conversation and um, have something that's meaningful and impactful, but also entertaining. And maybe you learn something new and maybe, you just enjoy it for what it is, but there's so much in the film that it was hard to get it all into an hour and a half, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, this documentary is, for those who haven't seen it, it is jam packed. I'm probably gonna see it two or three more times before I review it because I'm, I was writing my notes and I was just like, I can't comprehend this. There's so <laughs> much going on all at the same time. I actually had a, similar feeling with uh, My Name is Polly Murray at AFI Docs. Oh, yes. I haven't seen it yet, but I'm a huge fan of Polly Murray. I'm so glad they had this opportunity and to, to share them. I think she goes by them. Forgive me if I yes. have the wrong pronoun, pronoun, but I believe the preferred pronoun is that they, they, them, there. Um, but what an extraordinary story to be told. And it's really important for stories like this to be told now, it seems. There seems to be more willingness to really dive into some of the untold or unsung heroes or like yeah. the hidden figures of our culture and yeah. really truly understanding who we are that way. And it's, in that vein, uh, mm -hmm. I, this is one of my must ask questions because I sure. think we are in a year where we are seeing so many uncovered black stories. Mm -hmm. um, there's Summer of Soul, there's Ailey, um, who yes. kind of shows up in this film in, yes. in, a, in a way. A very and, big way, I'll tell you that in a moment. Yeah. <laughs> we couldn't um, get into it too much, but yes. And there's the, I, I don't want to call it the first black horror film because I think that goes to Get Out and you know, a few other dozens of, of things but there's First Date by Magnolia Pictures, which was mm -hmm. at Sundance. And there's just all of these great black stories that we, 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 um, we're we seeing this year, like Summer of Soul, that I think yeah. it is a unique moment. And I guess getting to my question is, um, what is your hope for the future of black voices in film or even just in general? Wow, that's a great question. My hope for the future of Black voices, I think it, well, speaking to what you've said about this being sort of a, 
a pivotal moment for the diverse, really to explore stories through more diverse eyes. I think that's the way I, I see it because there are myriad stories to tell and so many sort of untold or unsung heroes or un, un, untold stories that what you start to feel is that there's been a sense of erasure, which is a big yeah. theme that's coming up now. This idea of, especially the incredible amount of cultural influence and cultural and significant cultural uh, contributions that African Americans have made in our country and beyond the African diaspora, and that there's been like a almost a an intentional way of erasing that culture and it almost feels like if you don't tell the stories then they didn't happen or they didn't exist and therefore yeah, sure. you can't ascribe value to to blackness and to black art and so it even seems more paramount now that we are seeing these stories that there are more opportunities and really it's about visibility and being seen and specifically yeah. when you think really remarkable we're out there they've always been great you know it's not just black excellence as a hashtag, but they've always yeah. been innately excellent. The problem was that there wasn't access and there wasn't visibility and there weren't opportunities. And I think that's always the issue is like, what is the opportunity? Who has it and who doesn't? Is that a matter of privilege? Is it a matter of racism? You know, you, we could open up the, that can of worms. It's a whole other yeah. conversation. But this idea of what we're focused on now, diversity, equity, and inclusion, Yes, that those are important um, hashtags and also departments and different companies who are finally yeah. taking responsibility and accountability. But what it really boils down to is there is a depth and a range and a vibrancy and a complexity in Black culture and Black history that has been ignored or certainly suppressed. Yeah. And so in, in efforts to not really elevate these things and not elevate these Black institutions and and um, wonderful accomplishments. And so now that we're bringing these stories to the forefront, it creates a sense of equity. Yeah. And that's really, really important. And so I think this is a really dynamic time to be a BIPOC, as we call it, a yeah. storyteller, um, Black and digital, well, you know what BIPOC stands for. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, but not to say that it's only because now is the time. It's always been the time. I just think there's awareness now, critical awareness, especially after what happened last summer in this country and recognizing the dearth of, of diversity. And ironically, you see, that's cyclical, right? Because that was happening. That's what was in the zeitgeist in order for a show like Soul to exist, to come into being, was the recognition that there weren't enough black stories or people of color on television. And so, you know, after the um, Kerner Commission pretty much decided the report that there were, we were living in two Americas, one black and one white, and the media was largely responsible for this. So we talk about that in the film as being sort of the provenance of the show and why that would have been born at that time. And we see it happening again now. So it's really interesting to have a film like Mr. Soul to help us look back at that time, but also to help us lead the way right now as we're trying to find ourselves because we are, you know, we are at this sort of racial reckoning and divide in America, but I think we all need to figure out how to, how we're going to get, we're having these discussions about how we're going to move forward and yeah. figuring out how hopefully we can do that together. And I think films like Mr. Soul really, it, it sort of peels back the onion on, if you will, sort of a reverse Russian doll on, on what is important in the culture and being able to recognize that now is really encouraging and uplifting. And um, yeah, we're just super excited that it's happening now and that we have this wider platform on HBO Max because it means that so many more people will see it. We had a wonderful PBS premiere, but that's a very targeted audience. And so now having um, HBO Max nationwide and I think also Canada, yes. It's not going to be international. We have to get an international distributor for that, but we're working on it. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's I uh, with the I don't know if you saw, but the Clifford situation, um, mm -hmm. it's all a mess now because of different distributors, and they're like, "Well, we're supposed to be showing this in TIFF, but should we?" Um, but on the I, I think message of distributors you talk about hbo max it's hbo is when you think of hbo you think of documentaries 
I mean, yeah, their whole like like they've got a whole list. I mean, they're coming out with um, Obama in pursuit of a yes. perfect union. Uh, yes, I've seen, that's coming out this month as well. Yeah, the third, fourth, and fifth, which I'll also be reviewing. I saw parts one and two at AFI Docs as well. Fantastic. Um, and it's just this very documentary cent centered thing. Yeah. So I, my we're question. We're super, super excited about that because, you know, the, also what's interesting about HBO Max, they're kind of leading in many ways, uh, not just on the documentary front, but on the dynamic programming and very diverse programming. Some of their original yeah. programming, like um, Between the World and Me, ta Coates' piece, which was sort of a hybrid uh, documentary show. But the, at the same time, they're acquiring, you know, all the old chestnuts, you know, all of the Will Smith, um, you know, Fresh Prince episodes are yeah. now, you can binge watch those. But, but that's because it was WB and Warner Media took over HBO, so it makes sense. Yeah. But I just think that they are really leading in the sort of understanding the diverse world we're in and not doing it out of tokenism, like, oh, whoops, we forgot we don't have any black programming, we better get some black films. For I think sure. they really, really mean it. And um, it's exciting to be a part of that push. And at the same time, what they call, uh, what do they call it? The big, the big idea, which was, you know, the idea of releasing day and date, releasing films at the same time on the same day in theaters and in, um, in virtual cinema, which is, and streaming, which is changing the landscape entirely, um, especially for cinemas. Not everybody's happy about it, but I think the, the pandemic has proven it is what it is. that we're, we're shifting in how we get our media now. And a lot of people want to do it on their own time and binging, you know, they're working from home and it's just a different reality we're in. So I think HBO is ahead of the curve with that. And I think what's the big movie they're doing? Suicide Squad. Yeah. That's, that's... Coming out with a big comic book, you know, yeah. big, uh, what is it? Marvel, Marvel comics. I don't want to get it wrong and upset people. DC. Can you, thank you. Phew. That was close. Almost got in trouble. It, oh yeah. DC like and pseudo remake. I don't get it, but yeah. But all this to say, it's a huge honor to be on an incredible slate of films this class of August 2021, including yeah. one of my favorites, which is not a dog, but Shawshank Redemption. <laughs> so I'm going to be binging this all in Shawshank at the same time. <laughs> Um, and Malcolm and X, that. they've got they've got a big slate coming in. But yeah, shout out to HBO Max for yeah, for sure. I mean, it, this it's in my two years of doing well, not two years, one year of doing this. I, I apparently gave the pandemic two years. Apparently, um, smart. But <laughs> uh, um, I wish but, I'd planned uh, ahead. <laughs> um, I well, I lost my train of thought, um, but. Um, it's oh, I beg your pardon. I was interrupting you when I started no, no. talking about HBO yeah. and you had a question for me. I, the question was just about like, what do you think about the HBO Max kind of push? Because in my year of doing this, I've covered a bunch of things and mm -hmm. interviewed a few people. Um, and I don't think I've ever seen a streaming press day. It's weird um, because I was looking it up. I'm like, this movie came out three years ago and they're doing this big push. So they, they're getting behind this. Yeah. And you know, part of the reason it took so long, I think was we didn't know what was going to happen last year. We were trying to have a distributor in real life IRL and we didn't know the pandemic was going to hit. And then everybody was in that sort of nether zone of what's happening in the cinema you know, industry, will we have independent theaters anymore? Will we have, you know, boutique cinemas and art house cinemas and the people that usually, the partners that you usually have who would show or, or screen Mr. Soul. So we adapted to that. I think the word for the year was pivot. Yes. We all pivoted to this idea of, you know, in order to qualify for the Oscars and get the awards uh, run that we wanted to have, we distributed the film in virtual cinemas and we only had two, but we figured maybe we could get it going, premiere in New York and LA. And then suddenly everyone got on board because they realized, wait a minute, this is a way to keep our lights on as well. And so we did something unusual where we partnered with what started out as two, became 60. And then by the first week we had 90 cinemas across the nation 
that we were partnered with, but in a different kind of way, it was a rev share. So we okay. encouraged people to, you know, for the $12, half of it went to the theater of their choice. Say it was your favorite theater down the street. You know, if you're in LA, you know, it could have been Lemley, or if you're in New York, maybe it was, um, uh, you know, one of the ones downtown, our favorite theaters. And, um, forum film forum or 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 uh in our case mazels up in harlem and so the idea is you could know that you're helping to support that cinema or that organization like schomburg center or studio museum of harlem and so your money's not going anywhere else but to that place and then to the filmmaker and we rarely especially black women filmmakers we don't get that kind of support you know where it's direct so we built a real community around that and we streamed for almost a year and the first nine months were really, really robust. And so it took, it was, I was really proud of that because we didn't know what was going to happen or how people would respond because everybody was also trying not to get COVID, yeah. which isn't a job in and of itself. And then, you know, when they realized here's this little film that is really a love letter to Black culture and is, and is designed to make you feel good about yourself, it became an act of activism. It became an art of active art as activism, you know? Um, and so we felt like we were doing something. We were contributing to the movement in that way. Um, because, you know, when the whole George Floyd, Breonna Taylor thing happened, Ahmaud Aubrey, everybody, we, my peers, my friends, we all felt powerless, you know? And everybody was either out in the streets or, you know, laptop, Acti activists or on Twitter. And I thought, well, what people started asking me, oh, Melissa, how do you feel? How do you feel? How are you going to feel getting through the pandemic? And I said, I, I don't want people to ask me, how did you feel? I want them to say, you know, but what did you do? Hmm. What did you do to make a difference? You know, what did you do to make a change? It's not about how I feel. And so we decided, well, let's release the film and as cheaply as possible. So people can have something that makes them, that reminds them of their greatness in the midst of this horrific year, zero sum year that was challenging in so many ways. Here's this movie that reminds you that black is beautiful, that we have so much to offer. And that th this was a really extraordinary moment in time, you know, like a, a time capsule of, beaut of black yeah. beauty and excellence. And people really responded to that. And, you, and it wasn't, we weren't even sure really how it was going to look because we thought, well, maybe we shouldn't be asking for $12 in the middle of the pandemic. But instead, it gave people something to look forward to. And it helped, we helped all of those 96 theaters, you know, keep their lights on. And that was really great. I mean, in the end, I only made like $1 per, <laughs> per ticket, but I was proud of that dollar. <laughs> And I was proud. I know the feeling. Special, you know, and I know we'll look back and go, wow, we really did something special because that year could have been a nothing year. But had we yeah. not done that, we wouldn't have been, you know, shortlisted for the Oscars. We wouldn't have won the Critics' Choice. We wouldn't have won, you know, had three nominations for the NAACP Image Awards. And we wouldn't have created this love of support that is now championing the film to see it on hbo max because they're like yeah you did it yeah i mean that's you know like so it's very unusual it's definitely not a case study but it could be a case study in indie film distribution but highly unusual one yeah pivot, because pivot, pivot. that's all i can say <laughs> yeah because it seemed like last year when everyone was picking up films during Sundance, they were just like, man. Now what? And they'll just be like, here's $5 million went on a $20 million shoot. And it's like, yeah, I don't like, I don't know how I feel about just streaming, just throwing money at the problem. I'd rather things like this happen where it's just, yeah. hey, we really like this film. We want people to see it. And that's exactly what happened, because I will tell you, we went everywhere with the film. And the difficult thing was people weren't buying because yeah. nobody knew what was going to happen in the future of cinema. So it was an awkward moment. And we were like, well, we'll just keep asking until we get to the yes. 
and we got to HBO Max and they were the ones that said, yes, absolutely. We see the value of this. Um, and, you know, Summer of Soul is coming out on, um, is on Hulu. Yeah. But, but Hulu was an original partner. So that's an original film yeah. for Hulu. Whereas mine, we made all on our own. And then we, and then it was acquired by, um, uh, you know, it's like a straight acquisition for them. Yeah. For all you filmmakers out there wondering. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, that, I think that's just super cool. I, I mean, it's it's rare we see something like this happen. Yeah. Uh, um, and getting into the film itself. Mm -hmm. Um. So, uh, um, he was your uncle. Yes. And I always feel like sometimes when somebody is related, um, to the subject of the documentary, they have a tendency to insert their own voice into the I documentary. Know, I know exactly what you're saying. And, and maybe that... shift the narrative, be like, mm -hmm. okay, well, that was my dad, so I'm not going to leave this out or oh, not yeah. do this. And I guess the question is, how much did you resist that, that voice saying, hey, insert yourself in here? Because I didn't feel it. I'm so glad it was a real conscious effort. I always knew from the beginning that as much as I love Ellis and he's my spirit animal, my first babysitter, my, my everything, you know, my person, as they say, and the person who inspired me to become an artist and nurtured me, that this wasn't my story. And it, it was my story to tell and to usher forward, but this was way bigger than me. And that, that was daunting and also really important because um, understanding to try to build, well, not only for, um, you know, in an effort to build a 360 whole, fully wholesome realized character, um, but also for journalistic integrity, you know, yeah. it was really important that there was no display of hagiography, you know, it was yeah. really, really important that it not have any hagiography it could not reek of hagiography at all. I was concerned about that. And people would always say, oh, well, she's just making a Valentine to her uncle. And I didn't want that to be the case because this is a story of our culture and our history, but it's also uh, black history. It's American history, it's broadcast history. You know, it's the Black Panthers, it's the movements. It's, there's so many narratives and so many stakeholders in the film that it was really important in making a film that was only gonna be an hour and a half and had to be compressed to really illuminate the, the most salient moments, salient moments and important themes for the film. And so in order to do that, I had to remove my bias. On the other hand, the plus was that I am, because of who I am in the family, I had a different access point to people. And I also, knew where all the bodies were buried <laughs> and I also know all the secrets because I grew up as like the kid you know he yeah. nurtured me since I was like four years old and he took me everywhere and I went backstage on Broadway and I I was you know appointed to be Dr. Maya Angelou's you know gopher when he did an event with her and constantly put in these positions of listening and absorbing and taking it in and so I realized when he passed that I was had inadvertently become this sort of steward of his story. But that was also very scary to me because I didn't want my own personal bias to impact the film. So I had to work right. even like a hundred times as hard to make sure that it was unbiased and that I had a full view from the political side, the television side, the personal side, the queer side, uh, you know, there are many, facets of Ellis Hazla and just trying to be fair. And then of course, once you've done that, you have to be economic with your storytelling and you know, the editing will, it all came out in the edit. Um, so yeah, I was super aware of that. And in many ways, didn't want my last name to hinder the, um, the perception of the film or people thinking, you know, that it wouldn't be what it should be. Yeah, for sure. That makes sense, but you know what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I, yeah. I get you. Like w with a lot of documentaries, um, it, there is that thing in the back of your mind. I, I mean, 
that I just hear like you can feel it if, if it's not just one hundred percent. Yes, absolutely. Um, oh no, it's, it's it's sometimes it's imperceptible and other times it's really clear. <laughs> and um, I wanted the my voice to be sort of a cinematic voice, yeah. but the but the voice of Ellis to be front and set center in the in the film and to give him that kind of agency within his own story. And so we had to build the film that way to put him front and center. So it didn't seem like everyone else was presenting their version of Ellis. Um, yeah. And so we had to create that sort of um, uh, through line that we did with those little vignettes of his and all every single word in those little Ellis Hazlett vignettes that's um, voiced so beautifully by Blair Underwood they are all actually words that Ellis said verbatim. And then I called them over a course of 10 years and copious research from his journals and interviews with the New York Times. And then all the interviews he did with the black press like Jet and Ebony. And the tone would be different when he'd be talking to Jet and Ebony, of course. Uh, and sort of compiled inner office men memos and all the things, letters that he'd written to try to pull these quotes together. And so none of it is edited. And so we built the story basically using his own words, um, which is, it's an interesting thought now when you realize that Bourdain doc is getting so much flack yeah. um, for having AI, you know, to recreate Bourdain's voice. Although I love Morgan Neville. He's my, I, one of my idols. I think he's an extraordinary um, documentary filmmaker. I know he's getting some flack right now for the choice he made to recreate Bourdain's voice, but I, you know, maybe that's the next wave of yeah. doc filmmaking. It's a, it was a certainly a choice to make and it's very bold. Um, in our case, we just decided to have that, that the real voice of Ellis voiced by um, Blair Underwood and then to create sort of a unifying graphic aesthetic yeah. that would help you understand every time Ellis was speaking. That actually answers one of my questions actually, oh. that I had. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, those interstitials, you almost in the back of your mind, maybe because of that Roadrunner controversy, which in my opinion, I've said it in my review, it's not the worst thing of that documentary. There's stuff oh, in Asia yeah. Argento that maybe should have gotten covered. Um, <laughs> A, a bit more in the documentary. Um, it sounds, I mean, you have clips of um, Ellis talking in, in the episodes and it's imperceptible. Yeah. And there's only a slight difference. And the way I directed um, Blair Underwood, who is a phenomenal voice actor, by the way, in addition to being a regular actor, he does voiceovers and he, he has his own sh um, character that he plays in the um, the sequel to The Lion King, it's an animated show called The Lion Guard. And he, oh, yeah, has a, yeah. uh, he plays, I think, Maku, who's like a, a, one of the main characters. And um, he's really great. He's very evocative with his voice. And he also straddles this world where he kind of sounds like an old school Black guy and also someone contemporary. So you're not really sure yeah. if you're hearing Ellis or you're hearing Blair. And he really got lost in the character, which was important for us because we we didn't want him to mimic Ellis who has a very unique tone you know yeah she talks like this and yeah we didn't want it to be like a caricature we wanted it to be like well what would Ellis sound like in his head if it wasn't performative the way you think you know and and that aligned with my desire to show the interiority of blackness you know, and you don't often get to see on film what a, you know, the interiority of blackness. Uh, you saw it a little bit for the first time in the great doc, I'm Not Your Negro uh, by Raul Peck about James Baldwin. But though that was different because of course, James Baldwin is an incredible literary icon. And so you're used to seeing his words and hearing his words. In this case, they were read by um, Samuel L. Jackson. But with that film, I was very distracted by Samuel L. Jackson because I was like, it's Samuel L. Jackson yeah. at James Baldwin. And I kept expecting to hear, you know, what's in your wallet or <laughs> snakes on a plane or no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, I love the film, by the way. It's a very important documentary. But I, I was really conscientious about not distracting from Ellis Hayslip's tone. And when I directed Blair in the studio, we just we 
we nailed down all the um, VO sequences in one day. He was so receptive and so perceptive. And every time I would build out the story and say, okay, this is a moment where you're, you've literally experienced tremendous loss. You've lost something professional and you've lost something personal. No spoilers, I won't say what it is. And so if you could evoke that incredible sense of loss and conflict, and what would that sound like if you were talking to yourself or if you heard yourself in your head? And then of course he did it and it was just brilliant when he says sometimes it's necessary in the evolution of things to disappear and it turns out to be the most important line of the film on the one hand talking about what happened to his sister and on the other hand the loss of the show yeah and i was really moved by that and then what we did was we created a soundscape literally the specific sound effects every time you whooshed into the thought or the mind of Ellis. So there was sign, sound design for each one of those clips so that subconsciously when you're walking, watching the film rather, you slip into realizing, oh, now we're in Ellis's head, okay. Yeah. And once you hear the pattern, it's the same every time. And then when we added like the 5-1 stereo mix, it the whole thing was just incredible, just incredible. And so you have to think about how to it's not manipulative, but you know, just as you have lighting design and camera choices, the sound design is really important as well. It's almost as important as like your GFX, you know, your graphic effects. Yeah, it's kind of almost a painterly quality when you start getting yeah. into those interstitials. It's like, oh, well, now, now we're going to hear from Ellis. Exactly. And that was important because we knew we had a lot of disparate types of media that we're throwing at the audience from archival clips to contemporary interviews shot in four or five, six K. And then you've got the soul clips and then you've got the zeitgeist and you've got the sound. So the sound design for the film was very important. So it wouldn't be jarring to the audience to be like, yeah. wait, okay, now I'm in, in 1968. Okay, wait, now I'm in 2020. Wait, yeah. you know, then they would not, it wouldn't work. And so we had to have a through line that would let you know what you were like a roadmap for the film so that it didn't feel disjointed. So yeah, that it was a real challenge making this film and the decisions you make to make it seem seamless, but everything, every nuance and every choice is really specific. And I guess speaking to the archival footage, um, mm -hmm. we see a, a lot of the archival footage interview mix what, ever since I guess the zeitgeist of that was Apollo 11 back in 2019. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if anything surprised you going back into the old episodes or the archive and being like, oh, I don't remember it this way. Or was it just, oh, hey, I, I was there. No, you know, some it, there were so many Easter eggs and so many happy accidents, I like to say, you know, where, for instance, um, sidebar, but completely um, related, Questlove is a big fan of Soul. He has, you know, he's, he's like the serious rabbit hole of rabbit holes. <laughs> and when he goes in, he goes deep. And, and he has been collecting Soul ephemera all over the world and travels, you know, as you know, all over the world. And so, he had told me that he had been, he'd watched Soul growing up, his parents had watched it and he became obsessed with finding it. And he, wherever he goes, whether it's Japan or Europe or, you know, he'll, some people will approach him and know that he's collecting it. So he has as many, almost as many episodes as exist. And he told me that it so influenced the roots and the sets that they played on Soul that the roots would model their sets as eclectic and interesting as that. So I'm doing the interview with him we're in the dressing room, uh, which is like a green room at Jimmy Fallon. He's just walked off stage. He comes in and sits down. We have 20 minutes with him. And then he starts to just say all these incredible scenes that he remembers of Soul, one of which was the Earth, Wind and Fire moment. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, we modeled our set after them when we were like playing, or we, but without playing. And it totally blew my mind because I realized I didn't know that clip. As well as I totally knew, you know, I thought I know everything because I've 
been researching it ad nauseum for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And I realized, oh my God, I got to go back now into the Earth, Wind and Fire episode and find what he's talking about. And sure enough, there it was. I'd somehow not seen it the way he'd seen it. And we literally had to recut the film and put that in there because it was such a brilliant little, um, you know, like a gem. Yeah. Really, really special. So there are a lot of moments like that where the contemporary interviews we did brought us back into, or gave us access to the archive in a different way, especially for people who had been there, who could say things like, oh, you have no idea. Anna Maria Horsford's mother was cooking fried chicken and, and Diane was cutting hair. And, and when you walked in, you smelled Afro sheen and fried chicken. And you, you can't, <laughs> like, it's such a, <laughs> like a real thing. It yeah. puts you right in the room. And you realize that people's memories are right at the surface because it, it meant so much. And you know, that scene where Felipe Luciano in the end is taking us through right up until the arguments he had about the show being canceled. And he said it was so much power that he was in tears by the end of the interview. And it's 50 years later. Yeah. And Austin, he's like literally recounting it as if it was yesterday. Yeah. That was a surprise to me too, to recognize how significant this must have been when it happened, that all the memories are very real and very fresh. And that's when it started to dawn on me how important this show was to the people who were on it and in it, and especially for the first time. I literally had to pull over my car right before your interview because I got a call that said unknown and it was Arsenio Hall calling me for the first time in my life. I have tried for about eight years to get an interview with him and he couldn't secure that interview. And he called me to say how he remembered his time as a 16 year old magician being discovered by Elvis Hazlip and being put on flown from you know Chicago. I'm sorry, from um, no, it wasn't Chicago. It was uh, somewhere else where he was. I have to think about where that was. Anyway, he was flown there to New York, and again recounting it as if it were yesterday. And how he was really calling to congratulate me on the film, but to say how impactful that moment was. And of course, look at him years later, he becomes Arsenio Hall. Cleveland, that's where it was, Cleveland. He was living in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, and his mother had trotted him out to do magic tricks for, you know, like a Tupperware party. And the producer <laughs> whom Ellis had sent said, called him up and said, there's this, there's this kid. And I think we should, you should meet him. And Ellis said, fly the child to New York. <laughs> And the producer said, we can't do that. He's like 16. I don't think children can fly at, at 16 and, you know, in 1971 or whatever. Okay. So Ellis demanded it. And I, he may have gone there himself. I don't know what the story was, but yeah. So yeah, it's things like that, really recognizing the impact and the emotion and the resonance, the deep resonance um, that re that really reiterated for all of us on the team that this was an important story to document before it's gone and before the people who lived it are gone. As many of our you know, African-American icons of the 20th century are aging and leaving us. Yeah. And then who will be here to tell their stories, you know? For sure. And, you know, I wish more people in my area had, would have seen the show. Um, well, I've got some good news. Just cutting in to say there are 24 episodes streaming on Amazon Prime. Oh. So I'll check that out. link. <laughs> Go to Amazon Prime and just search in the search bar soul with an exclamation point, And you can watch 24 episodes there. You can also watch on Shout Factory as well. Okay. I'll send it to my friends because I because I was asking around and I was just like, Hey, have you seen this? Have you seen this? Do you know who this guy is? Yeah. And they're like, no, who is this guy? <laughs> and I'm like, uh, I'll, I'll tell you later. I, I just got to get on this interview. And, um, I just, I'll send that link to them because I think this is something that just the documentary alone, people need to see. I mean, even if you pair it with 
even if it's to take a day out or a weekend out, I mean, with some yeah, of the- pair it with Summer of Soul too. Yeah. I, wrote, I wrote a really great article, I'll have to send it to you. Um, I had the pleasure of writing an um, article for Documentary Magazine. Oh, and cool. um, I had a great conversation with Questlove um, and I wrote this piece about Summer of Soul and I interviewed him, um, much like you're interviewing me, but not on camera. Uh, Cause he was in on his way to the tonight show at the time. <laughs> so it was in the car, but um, uh, check it out. We ended up talking about the importance of curating black joy and the similarities of our films, how, you know, these sort of epic kind of um, high watermark um, watershed moments of black culture experienced on mass, you know, sort of great cultural moments are now being unarchived for the first time and the importance yeah. of that. Um, yeah, so it just came out. It's going to be out in print for this month, but it's okay. also available online. It's a really, it was a really important conversation for us to have. And I was so grateful to be the one to write it. It was written, it turned out to be 51 pages. So we had to cut it down to 10, <laughs> but it still is such an impressive wow. conversation. And I just hope that they keep all the audio because I'm like, you guys have a gold mine on your hands because yeah. You know, we ended up talking for like three hours in three different Zoom calls. And um, I'm just so happy to capture him at that this moment as he is his you know, first time director. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it was great. But I want to thank you so much. Oh, oh, did you have any other questions for me? Oh, no, no, no. Uh, OK, I just. Yeah, I, I, I hope people see this film. Um, thank you. But, I mean, it comes out tomorrow as of this recording uh yeah. and uh, yeah <laughs> oh, I, I just can't wait um i uh, and i've actually got well something to reveal i i realized when going back in my research for this I'll, i had been sent emails for it before and i was like oh i i passed up like two or three things on it but i'm also appreciative that i saw it now in it when you know we're seeing Summer of Soul, Ailey, all these uh, stories uh, yeah. um, about Black excellence um, because it is only amplified mm. um, oh. my enjoyment. Oh, that's so special. Thank you. I'm honored. That is beyond honored to hear that. That is really, really worthwhile. Makes me feel like it's been worthwhile. <laughs> it, it is. Um, but I just... Melissa, I, I just want to thank you so, so much for your time on a Saturday, even. Oh, um, thank you so much. I know we, I missed you the last time. So thank you for your patience and, and no reschedule. Problem. But um, yeah, just thank you so much. If for people who are watching this in the future, um, go check it out on HBO Max. It'll be live as of this uh, going live because I've got to edit this. Um, and I'll have my review up. I'll have Obama in pursuit of a per perfect nation oh, later fantastic. in the week. Oh, great. Are you Rotten Tomatoes as well? Unfortunately, no. Okay, um, not yet. That's okay. I've got one more <laughs> year before I can apply. Nice. Well, let me know because you can always put it up even if it's a year later. But it will be on a, you need a quorum. Machine. You know, we need a quorum of, we are, we are, um, we are, 100% fresh, but in order to be certified fresh, you have to have a certain number of interviews and um, reviews that have already been done. Yeah. And so, yeah. Help us get certified fresh. <laughs> yeah. And it was funny, um, not to keep you too long, but when I reviewed You Cannot Kill David Arquette, yeah. um, I think it was the director or somebody DM me on Instagram. It's, I don't know if I should tell the story, but I'm going to tell it anyway. Um, <laughs> He DM me on Instagram because I tagged pretty much everyone in this, in these things. And he was like, hey, are you accredited with like Rotten Tomatoes? Because we really want to get the documentary up there um, to fresh or certified fresh. Because I think I'd, I forgot what my rating was. I think it was like a four or 4.5 out of five. Um, and it, I just love moments like this. Yeah. Um, where I get to talk to directors. So thank you so, so, thank you. so much. It's not very often that I have an opportunity. So I'm really, really grateful to you. And thank you for giving, allowing us to have a voice too. And yeah, to, no sh problem. to share our filmmaking process because that, 
that is, it's, it's a real privilege and real honor to be able to share that. So I humbly, I just want you to know, it's not a lot lost on me. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, uh, thank you again so much. Thank you.